One thing about analog, it takes time. <laughs> Everything's in real time and stuff. And it's... I quite enjoy it, though. My name's Chris Webb. I go by the production name of Fremonk. I'm a producer, recording engineer, mixing engineer as well. And I work out of the studio that I built, the Friary Studios. I've been doing so for the last five or six years. I was a session bass player for a good 10 years, right from when I was 17. And I love the touring, love the traveling, but I felt the ceiling of it, creatively speaking, kind of playing other people's bass lines, other people's music. So when I transitioned into production, I fell in love with old analog stuff. So me and my wife decided to move out of London, build a big studio and fill it with as much analog old stuff as humanly possible. Adapting an analog workflow in the modern world, it, it, it depends on who you are as a producer and how you choose to approach it. Uh, there's amazing mixing engineers like MSM who have managed to, to integrate it kind of almost side by side. It seamlessly kind of you know, moves with each other. Whereas I tend to, I work a lot in, 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 in the analog world. And for me personally, I don't necessarily do it because I profess it to be better. I just prefer doing it. And I prefer the the limited amount of choice I have as far as whether it's a compressor, whether it's an EQ, whether it's the number of channels, the number of channels on the tape machine, the instruments I've got around, you know, if the artist can't afford a full string section, I would rather not go down the route of MIDI because I think it's not, you're not going to get the same feeling as it might sound fantastic, but you won't get the same feeling of strings. So why don't we bring a Mellotron in? Why don't we try that part on organ? And it's those tactile kind of analog touches that I think make a sound different. And I always, I always tell artists, well, if you listen to a D'Angelo album, you know it's D'Angelo before he sang a note. And that's so, so powerful. And it's a testament to what, you know, Russell Elevado and D'Angelo and Questlove are all doing. Um, and I think that's the goal. And I think you, you can only get to a new sound by experimenting. You know, because you don't, you, it's, it, it's, it's easy to imagine a new sound, but in practice, when you try and do that, it, it, it can be quite challenging. And then you evolve into a sound that is an offshoot of the sound that was in your head. Yeah, that makes sense. So from a writing standpoint, I only get involved as a producer, I call it. So I'll give opinions on songs, I'll give opinions on maybe the tempo, maybe the key, particular chord changes. I very rarely create something from scratch unless it's in the hip hop realm or kind of alternative where someone needs a beat. Again, I do that in the analog world on an old MPC from 1999, I believe. My main thing is just to create an atmosphere specific to each artist, uh, just making them feel as comfortable or as, or as uncomfortable as possible. Uh, kind of depends on their own creative process. If you notice they need to be angry for a vocal take, all of that kind of thing. Uh, so it's as much about figuring out their workflow. Some artists love to work really fast and three or four songs a day. The other, I have, I have a particular artist who comes who loves taking two naps a day. So, you know, we break for lunch, I go and walk the dog. Um, so it's all, I kind of gear everything towards the artist and, and make them fall in love with the process of making the song, because I think that when it comes out the speakers or the headphones, you know, on the other side, once it's mixed and mastered, I feel like people just, just recognize that energy that was, that was put into the song, you know, at conception. You get a sense for the type of music someone listens to, if they like old soul, if they like crackly vocals, that kind of thing. Even as a rapper, you 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 recognize that, oh, you might love when I turn the tape machine on. You might love when I put turn an analog compressor on. You might love that certain records were done on this desk, you know? And uh, I, 
so I, it, it's just about chatting with the artist, really. Just have a talk, have a hang first. I always like to, if I, if I know I'm going to get involved in a long project, like an EP or an album, certainly when I'm producing, I like to just go for lunch first. It can come here, listen to some music first, have a chat about the type of music you think you want to do uh, or you know you want to do. But I always find an artist thinks they know what they want to do. And then during the process of creation, that can shift ever so slightly. Yeah, yeah, that's Prince on this desk. It's good to some digging to get the photo. <laughs> <laughs> but it, yeah, so I think he worked on like diamonds and pearls no. on it. Uh, Peach. Um, God, no, yeah, I think there was an album with Mavis Staples as well. He did like late, late, at a different time as well. Um, yeah, and, and, then, and then like Rolling Stones was done on it. Um, like Plan B's albums, um, Bjork, mm -hmm. Eric Clapton's Beneath the Cradle. Yeah. Loads of just lovely, you know, Lion King, just just loads, loads of lovely stuff. And um, yeah. And the speakers, Oasis's albums were mixed on the speakers. Oh, really? Yeah, they used to be in Orinoco's um, oh, wow. The Red Room. Um, and all of Chemical Brothers stuff, nice. if you're into that kind of thing, yeah. Lana Del Rey's stuff. Yeah, old stuff tends to have history. Yeah. The old good stuff, you yeah. know what I mean? That's the, that's the thing. Yeah, so uh, depending on your levels of romanticism for it all, like it's the same signal path that <laughs> Prince used for his guitar or whatever. I think he DI'd guitars, so he probably would have just plugged straight in. But that makes a difference if you tell a guitarist that. It yeah. just makes his performance better, which is the point. So yeah. if, if, if that helps him get there, so be it. Um, yeah, I love it. And it is like an instrument. Like the tape machine can be an instrument. Like the space echo can be an instrument. It can all just be weird little things that sprinkles on a record yeah. or the main sample of a hip hop beat. God knows. Yeah. I never am arrogant enough to assume that I know what they're going to want their music to sound like. But I like to just let the process happen and... I like to be open-minded enough to evolve and learn from the artist as well. You know, I don't, I'm not, stu I'm not a producer that's completely stuck in my ways as far as beats or sonics or if I think the track should have strings at the beginning, I'm open-minded enough to go, do you know what, maybe it's just vocals and guitar by the end of it. But I think there has to be a certain amount of trust between a producer and an artist. And, and that goes both ways, you know, and so sometimes I'll say, listen, let's hear the idea. Let's, let's, let's kind of, if, if it is strings, let's put some strings down before we get a string section in. Or if we've got the luxury of recording the strings, do that and then see how it sounds, hear how it sounds, because you can't necessarily imagine what an idea is going to come to. You know, you can have an exact string arrangement, but in the moment when you hear the string players play it, you might just say, do you know what? Could you just do a diminuendo into that section? Can you not play in that section? And let's quickly write a different arrangement for the next section. So I prefer working in a bit more of a malleable way than just setting ideas set in stone. I've been working with Robin Katz recently. He's an amazing neo-jazz, neo-classical nylon guitarist. He's got a background in doing a lot of work at places like Ronnie Scott's doing Django Reinhardt kind of tribute nights. Uh, Absolutely phenomenal musician. I absolutely loved working with him. A wonderful trumpeter called Graham Flowers came and layered up some flugelhorn for us. Uh, so I'm going to whack that on tape and see how I can manipulate it. I might half the speed of it. So we've got an octave below kind of going on. The lovely thing about tape is there's no artifacts. You know, digitally sometimes when you pitch something down, you can just hear the computer struggling with this. There's just, there's, it's just a very smooth, very seamless. I also might try a bit of vary speed, which is when you vary the speed of the playback of the tape up and down. And that will change the pitch as well. So I might get a nice kind of little warble that I can put under the existing horns. So these are all just flavors and sprinkles to go with the actual horns, basically. these machines, the MCI, Sony MCI, is you can kind of, you can grab at things and it's very, very forgiving. This year in particular, I was kind of doing a lot of hip hop, the George, Reg32, the, the RV, those kind of things. And 
and it's for, and, and stepping over into the jazz world, you know, the following week after sometimes sometimes a session like that, it's a real reset where it's a lot more about the ambience and it's a lot more about the little the nuances of engineering, you know, which in hip hop it's all quite hard hitting and you know it's quite full on, whereas in Robin's music you can hear a chair creak and I love that, you know, it's, it's this is real kind of you know this this space in the music. But he was fresh off doing an album with an orchestral arranger called Guy Barker, amazing conductor, com composer, arranger. But that was a very different experience because he had composed, I think, a whole album of songs, six or seven, six or seven songs, and Guy Barker did the orchestral arrangement. They went into a studio, and that was that. You know, it was all captured live. Whether whether we are. We had an initial stage with the band, which was, you know, drums, a bit of piano, a bit of organ, sometimes bass, sometimes upright bass, uh, sometimes just Robin. And then the tracks have gone through this evolution where we might want to double a nylon string. He's mainly a nylon string guitarist. We might want to double that with an electric guitar. We were tracking flugelhorn earlier in the week. We got a beautiful BV section in yesterday uh, just to add some little sprinkles onto notes, uh, there's some synths, and that's all been sprinkles after that fact, you know, so we've got the core, we've got the foundation, and then we're seeing how can we make this different. <laughs> I think as the music's progressed, his trust has deepened. You know, so when I have a weird idea, he lets me go through with it. And then he might say, I don't like that, but could you hold that note on the roads or could you hold that, you know, tape echo? And it might lead to another idea. And I'm open-minded open enough to realize, well, this is his music. He's going to be gigging this. It's, it's got his name on it. So I can easily adapt my ideas to get to something that we both like. I don't think you can complete music production. It's not, I don't think you can be the best and you can, you can, I think it's, it's so ever evolving. You look like, you, you look at some people I've always looked up to, like, you know, Mike Dean, Russell Elevado. And, you know, I think Mike Dean is going to be 60 soon and he's still on the cutting edge of so many things. So I think as long as you're open-minded enough, you can, you can just keep yourself interested and keep evolving with the music or the sound of the industry. You know, when auto-tune came along, when plugins came along, learning how to adapt like an analog workflow to that is, is just ever changing. I might put a uh, a horn section on the tape machine with a view of slowing it down uh, but then I might discover a, a kind of warble on it that, that's amazing I might try and speed it up going into a section then I might put some reverb on it because it's quite reactive you know um, and I like the fact that in the analog realm you can't see numbers you know I always find when I'm when I'm in the box and again this is very personal to me and how my head works where you move a fader and you can see you've gone up 2 dB or you know 3 dB Whereas on this, it's like a couple of millimeters. I have no idea. When someone and when someone says, "Oh, can the vocal be, you know, a bit louder?" I don't just nudge it up. I, I whack it straight back down to zero, and then feed it in. And a lot of people who work in the box panic at that. They say, "Oh, I just wanted it exactly where it was, but just a bit up." And I'm like, "Well, let's just use our ears and trust." You know, I have no screen, but this side. So when we're when we're on the desk, we're listening, and when we're editing, we're using our eyes. I've spent a long time building up these contacts of amazing musicians and I, when I call someone, I generally call someone to have their own personality 
and, and be able to impart that personality, whether it's on drums, keyboards, horns, onto a track. And it will always be like a collaborative experience where we're trying to we're trying to figure out what we want. You know, I'll, I'll say, oh, maybe it could be this. And they might play it in a slightly different way because of their personality. And that might lead me to another idea. And the artist is sometimes nervous at the start of that process because they're not hearing exactly what was in their head. But then when they hear it back coming through the speakers, they suddenly just have this moment of everything's going to be okay. You know, you just have to, every, if everyone in the room has an open mind, that's all I ask. I think when an album reaches that point where you are trying to push boundaries and the sonic really starts taking shape, it's the last 5% that is the hardest bit of the whole album. Um, it's, and, and you have to step back and listen to the context, you know, and there's some decisions I know I'm going to make, uh, be it in the production or even in the mix, where I might mute the bass for the start of the organ solo which we didn't notice at the time, but then if it's coming out of a track where the whole band has just been, you know, absolutely blazing and raging and there's solos happening, the next track just might need a little bit more restraint. So I guess that's the only downside of doing an album like this in bits where you're trying to chase a new sound is that you have to do a little bit more post, but I'm fine with that. And that's part of the modern thing as well, going back to integrating old techniques with new the old way would have been you capture exactly what it is and you leave it alone whereas now we can we've got the luck i mean you always had the luxury you could cut the tape you could mute a channel but now you know in the computer it's quite easy to experiment with that like oh what happens when we take the bass out and you don't have to sell a tape the tape back together or something you know chord electronics came into my life with a typical nerd chat with msm who is a fantastic uh, mixing engineer based in London. And he, I'd noticed he was using Chord Electronics and I asked him, you know, what's all this? And he gave a very MSM answer, was just like, go try it, you know, no specifics. And I went with, I went with the Alto because I rely on NS10s quite heavily during tracking and production and mixing everything. Uh, I think they're just, they're horrible, but they, they do what they're supposed to and, and, you, and you, your ears just get used to hearing certain things on them that are out of, out of place or that need adding. And the Alto was so small, being very honest, I was quite skeptical about how it could provide enough power for the NS10s and have headphone amps. And But, the, you know, Tom from Chord came over and again, they weren't, it, there was no sales pitch. It was like, have a listen. And I had a listen and it took me down a rabbit hole of wanting chord everywhere. Um, and it's, it's, it's just absolutely brilliant. And I've actually found it uh, useful in other sessions where sometimes I track in London in, in, in bigger studios. And there was a particular studio with a lovely old Trident desk, but there was the band were in the same room. So we had to track on headphones. And the way that studio was set up, I wasn't happy with the monitoring I was getting on the headphones. And I just popped this in the bag, you know, you know, went back to London and it was just, I, I just felt like I knew what I was hearing again, you know, decent pair of headphones, you know, had that there plenty again. And I felt like I knew what was happening again. And I ended up mixing that EP. And when I came back in here, be it on headphones or NS10s, it was the same feeling again, which I wasn't getting with the current system. The NS10s are, are, are known for, you know, certain kind of peaks and stuff, and it still has that enough for your critical ears. But I think when the artists are in the room and 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 I do, and I am on NS10s, I try not to be with the artists too much because um, they are for crit critical listening, but absolutely the artists just have a better time when, you know, with the NS10s on now, uh, it's opened the sound up of them. It's not just about the, the frequency spectrum. It also somehow gave them more depth. And I realized that the amp I was using before was just squashing the sound. Uh, so that was a real eye opener, you know, and before I would always switch the NS10s off when the artists were listening back, but now sometimes I leave them on. The fact it's portable as well with something like that is just, is, is brilliant. And I could have, thinking back, I could have actually wired their NS10s in as well if I wanted to, you know. We didn't get that far, there was a bit too much going on in a session like that. Um, 
alt rock shout out to shaney white but um it's just made my life a bit better <laughs> which is it was always good in the world of this channel's crackling that tape machine is you know the valve's gone and all this analog stuff it's nice to have something which is just a bit of a rock <laughs> 